I'm going to be an owner who builds a team that has continued success. We want to create a blueprint for winning. I don't just want to get into the playoffs. I want to win a championship. Welcome to Baseball Biz. I'm Mark Herbert, your host, and with me is none other than Mr. Brandon Noway. Brandon, how you doing today, buddy? I'm not doing half bad, just trying to stay dry out here. How are you doing? I'm doing just that as well. Living here in the lovely world of Tampa, you just never know what is going to happen. And between thunderstorms and such, a lot of excitement. Not as much excitement as what's going on with the world in baseball. You, you know, the World Series is over. There's awards going on. But what's going to happen after that? What, what happens in the off season? Well, a lot more than most people think. And one of those things happens to be a new owner for the Mets. It's all been done. There's no J-Lo. No, no, no. She's not owning a team. There's no A-Rod owning a team. But there is a Steve Cohen who owns a team. And yeah, and, and if I were a Mets fan, I would be thrilled to have this dude as my owner. Just listen in to his press conference and what he had to say. I, I'd be over the moon. Yeah, well, let's, let's play that again. You may ask what kind of owner I'm going to be. I'm going to be an owner who builds a team that has continued success. We want to create a blueprint for winning. I don't just want to get into the playoffs. I want to win a championship. So, you know, that said, I mean, this man sounds committed. If I was a Mets fan, and actually I'm, I think I'm becoming one after hearing his words, this man is an owner who is excited about his team. He says he wants a blueprint for success, and this man wants a championship. And I don't have any doubt within the next four or five years, Mets will have one. And truth be told, I think that would be too long for him. I think he'd want it sooner than that. Yeah, and honestly, maybe we should become Mets fans. That, that can be our NL team. But so far, he seems like, in my opinion, he is like my dream owner. He grew up a Mets fan. He grew up going to Shea Stadium, taking the train there. And... You know, he, he got into it because he wants to have fun. He wants to win and give back to the fans. And we saw it. He was reaching out on Twitter to the fan base, asking what they want to see. And it really seems like to me what owner should be. Well, I know. I, I think you talk about blueprints. He could be a blueprint for an owner. I mean, being here in Tampa, we know we have our own love for the Rays. And some questions not quite as exciting about our owner, but – the thing of it is, yeah, uh, it's it's uh, it's exciting times. I mean, but uh, Cohen actually tends to be kind of said. Uh, I think he could be a blueprint for what an owner can be. Maybe I'm I'm putting a lot on him too. Now I'm expecting a lot from the things he said. And though he is somebody like you said, started out as a fan of the game, and a couple of things that were real encouraging that I heard him say also was one that. He is going to trust his people to make decisions. They're going to come to him, but he's going to trust them to be the ones who make the decisions for the team. Yeah, and that's really important to me because even though he's he is a baseball fan, obviously, he's he admits, he's like, hey, I'm not the smartest guy in the room. I don't know anything. I'm going to let the baseball people do that. And, you know, that's a smart thing to do because how many times do we see owners thinking they're the smartest guy in the room and it ends up backfiring in their face. Well, he'll tell you, too. He says, I don't want to be the smartest guy in the room. You know, he, he's sort of like, um, say, a, a president who has a cabinet around them. They want to have people who are intelligent in the different areas. You know, whether it be a batting coach, whether it be a scout, whether it be a general manager, you want to have that kind of staff. And he's starting out with that. I don't think he's clearing house. One of the things he was talking about was he said they'd be doing some hiring but he said some of that's going to be from inside, too. He's he's looking at talent that's there, not just those that are out in the market somewhere. So that's encouraging because it says that he has, he has what, some positivity about the staff that are there and some expectations of that staff as well. So I was encouraged by that. This is the kind of, like I said, this is the kind of owner that any of us would love to have. Yeah, and it, it seems like it's going to affect the on-field product, too, because we saw Marcus Stroman, I saw him tweet out earlier, that, that press conference fired him up, too. He said that he's excited to play and he can't wait to represent the Mets this year, and he's ready to go out there and do great things. So 
if that press conference translates to the field, it's going to be great. Now, he's a free agent too right now, isn't he, Stroman? Um, I don't think so. I think he's he's signed for another year. Oh, good, 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 good. Well, that's fantastic. You know, when you hear that kind of encouraging words from players like that, that helps. I mean, and let's take a look at who they have with the Mets. You've got folks like, uh, well, you talk about Tampa being from there. we got Pete Alonso there, don't we? Yeah, he's still there. He's one of the, the great young guys coming up. And Stroman, he accepted the Mets uh, qualifying offer. Well, that's great to hear. I mean, in this world right now, the COVID-19, I think a lot of things are up there in the air as far as who's going to be where. So it's encouraging to see something like that with uh, with Steve Cohen and players that are saying, yes, I'm a Met. I want to continue to be a Met. Yeah, and it makes you wonder if, you know, maybe Cohen didn't take over. If it was still the Wilpons, would Stroman have walked? I don't know. I, I've got to question that too because – I think with Steve Cohen right now, there's an excitement about the team. People see a future. And this is a guy who's a billionaire who tells you, he says, I'm not here to make money. I'm here to build something for the fans. That's part of the, I'm paraphrasing the quote, but that's basically what he was saying. He's saying, I'm here to build something for the fans. I'm here to build something with excitement. I'm here to win championships. Gosh, I wish I could hear that from Tampa. But, <laughs> you know, but I mean. We hear from our other organizations. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, but that's, I, I, th- I think it's an exciting t- time for him. I mean, it's for everybody who's a Mets fan. And like I said, I think that kind of excitement can certainly go out across all of the people out th- who are on the team and free agents who are out there uh, beyond the team, too. And let's, let's uh, take a look at some. Do you have anything else on Steve Cohen you want to say? Um, I, I think he, he might have like that, how when Steve Ballmer took over the Clippers, they were kind of like a lower, lower end team. People were making fun of them and it's, they still do, but like he brought an excitement to him, you know, with his press conference and he's up there yelling, yelling woos and dancing on the, the sidelines. I mean, if you can bring that excitement to baseball, that would be great, especially from an owner. You build something that gives an ownership, if you will where the fans actually believe they're part of the team and they follow them all the way through the championship. And even if things fall short now and then, good fans will stay with them, especially if they feel like the owner is making a commitment and the players are there as well. So I salute Steve Cohen and I wish the Mets the very best. And that's going to be an exciting time. But, you know, one of the things we were talking about too, uh, you and I, before we got started with the show, is there is movement right now. We talk about being the off season. There are a lot of free agents, and I'm not sure how that's going to play out just yet, too, because who's available, who's really ready to make a decision, and with 2021, what kind of agreement are you going to have anyway? I mean, is it going to be another 60-game season? Is it going to be a half of a season? I don't know, but um, it has to be impacting the negotiations. So looking at some of those free agents, you and I picked up about three or four we thought were worth discussing today. And one of them, the first of them, was probably one of the most controversial. He's not controversial being a free agent, but just a controversial personality. And that's Mr. Trevor Barr. Yeah, he's he definitely puts his name out there a lot and not afraid to speak his mind. And, hey, you know, you do you, man. And it, it worked for him this year. <laughs> you do you, man. I like that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting. We're talking about these three guys here, the first three anyway, Trevor Barr, pardon me, Trevor Barr, J.T. Remoto, and uh, D.J. LeMayhew. Those are the ones we're going to talk about today. The, all those guys are around the same age, somewhere between 29 and 32, and that's what it takes to, I mean, to elevate up from minors to majors to six years to be free agent. Trevor, Trevor distinguishes himself above and beyond the mound. He has his own. He does so much with YouTube. He has his own products. And he's very outspoken. He's let everybody know he is a free agent this year. And he almost makes it a competition with, with social media about, hey, do you think I'd be a good fit there in New York? Or, uh, hey, you think San Diego or the, the Giants? I'm throwing just throwing things out there. But he's constantly almost like baiting fans from different teams to, to ask him to, to come there. Yeah, off the field, he's like a... 
he's like what baseball needs. He puts himself out there. He's entertaining. He's really not afraid of anything, to be honest. He'll he'll make fun of himself. He'll make fun of others, and he goes with it. He he's what makes sports fun and something that baseball needs. But on the field, I looked at his stats on Baseball Reference. He hasn't been like a top tier pitcher most of his career. He's really kind of been average. I believe it was 20, look over my notes here. They're a bit messed up. It's 2018 was his best year with Cleveland. Uh, Back when he won the Cy Young, he had a 221 ERA. And then last year at a 173 ERA. But his career, he's at a 390 ERA. But he's at a really good to average. And honestly, I'd, I'd take him on. If we could catch him with a really good year, I'd love to have him. Oh, yeah. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, that 173 ERA, that's pretty sweet. And looking across to what, uh, let's see, between he had in 2020, he had 73 innings pitched, 100. Strikeouts, let's see, and for the career, he's had 11 and 9, what, 1,190 innings pitched in 1,279 strikeouts. Hmm. I don't know. I, I would almost expected more strikeouts than that from him, but that's, that's his entire career, and I think he's getting better as he moves along. I like you, I, I do believe that he is certainly a well, well, he, he's certainly a great addition to the game. And he bring does bring a lot of excitement to it. Yeah, and it seems like he hasn't been on the greatest of teams his whole career either, so that could factor in as well. But if you put him on a good team, and what we saw him do in the playoffs, and he's just now coming into his prime, he could be one of the better pitchers in baseball for over the next few years. So I'd say take that shot. Well, do you think the Mets would be looking at him? Do you think Steve Cohen said, hmm, is that somebody we want? Or do you think maybe the Yankees say, well, we got Gary Cole, but we could probably use another guy like this? Well, if I were the Mets, I would definitely take a shot. You know, say, hey, I'm committed. I want to win. This is a guy I want to bring in here that I believe can help us win. I would do that. And I believe it was, it was baseballrumors.com that they did a list of all their top 50 free agents and who they think are contenders. And they put for uh, Bauer, the Dodgers, Yankees, of course, and then the Phillies, Mets, Blue Jays, Braves, White Sox, Giants, Angels, Twins, Padres, and Nationals. Jeez. <laughs> wow. They, he, they just kind of covered all bases for him. I mean, just, he, he, well, he's, he's a talent. He brings a certain excitement. He certainly brings a lot of personality, which I think, a lot of teams need, and I, I like you know we talk about Mike Trout and all that, but he's he's the sub dude, you know he's not going to be somebody who's out there all the time. But certainly with Trevor Bauer, between his social media and uh, just his personality overall, I think yeah he can be he can be a great player, a great pitcher, and also a great personality for a team. I will be curious to see who actually does come up. And I said something briefly, and you did too, about the Yankees with him. And looking, I was looking at, uh, let's see, Garrett Cole. I think both he and Garrett Cole went to UCLA, so that would have been kind of interesting. I, I'd heard that it wasn't necessarily always on the best of terms there too. So I don't know if that'd be a good fit or not. Ooh, that'd be a good fit. Maybe uh, cause a little bit of a disruption in that locker room. Yeah, huh? Maybe, you know, and uh, got to say, well, let me, is my salary bigger than yours? You know, <laughs> there's a different, <laughs> that would be interesting. Yeah. There's a different way of measuring uh, up to one another when it comes down to dollars. Okay. All right. Well, that's, I'm looking at Trevor Bauer too. So I think he's definitely probably one of the biggest uh, traffic will be on him as far as the draft choices. But another one you and I were talking about was JT Ramuto and JT's got quite Quite a good experience too, and what's see? He's a catcher, which I'm always in, I'm enamored with. Okay, I mean, I look around some of the catchers. Some of my favorite players have been catchers, like Darno. You know, when he was with Tampa, Wilson Ramos, another one, Kevin Cash, another one. Okay, I'm stuck in Tampa, but <laughs> those are, are some of my favorite guys I've seen out there. I've, when it comes to catchers, I love seeing a catcher who can not only perform, you know, behind the plate. And intelligently behind the plate, but also do something at, at the at bat as well. Yeah, to me, Real Muto is like a really 
he's one of the best catchers in baseball, if not the best. And he's pretty much does what you like. I mean, to me, a catcher, it's no big deal if you can't, you know, kill it at the plate every now and then is much more important to me what you do behind the plate. I mean, career-wise, he's hitting 278, 840 OPS, 95 homers, 358 RBIs. And he's ended up winning two two All-Stars, a gold glove, and two silver sluggers. And he has a caught stealing career of, or not, not over his career, but last year the caught stealing was 42.9%. So Jeez, Pete. A really all-around catcher. Yeah, that that's a heck of a performance. You know, you're not letting much get by with that kind of catching the people with stealing. That's that's amazing, and certainly he would be an attribute to just about any team. Yeah, and you know he's with the Phillies this year. They offered him a uh, the qualifying offer. He hasn't taken it yet, from what I've seen. But if they, he does reject it, you know, teams that are looking to possibly sign him are the Mets, of course. <laughs> the Yankees, you know, they got to throw their name in there every now and then. The Nationals, Astros, Angels, Blue Jays, Reds, or Cardinals. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing him. Like I said, when it comes to catchers, especially somebody who can perform as well as he does, like you said, not looking necessarily for a lot of plate action, but those are decent numbers. A much better number than a, a lot of catchers out there, unfortunately. But he's like ours. He's, like ours yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we talking about Tampa again. Uh, you know, love Zanino, but. He's great at getting a home run every now and then, but a lot of times at the bat, you know, he's under, he's definitely under 200. And yeah. uh, that, that's sad. That's sad. Uh, when we lost Arno in, in Tampa, my, I cried, you know, because I thought, geez, and crackers, guys, this guy is worth it. You know, go ahead and get him on a two year contract. You don't have to love him forever, but right now he is so hot. If we had had Darno on our team, there is no doubt in my mind that the Rays would have won the freaking World Series. Yeah, I remember we had to wipe your tears off of the soundboard when we were in the studio. <laughs> yeah, it, it was that kind of sad, sad, sad thing. But anyway, get, getting back, back away from my sadness and back to JT. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah, he's he's going to be a great find for whoever gets him. And I will be curious to see how many folks do wind up with uh, with uh, Mets with Steve's, uh, Steve Cohen's approach, because it's going to be different. You know, I'm looking back at these guys we're talking about, like Bauer and Ray Muto and also uh, Mayhew, all these guys are about, like I said, they were looking around, now somewhere around the 2009, 2010, 2011 drafts. JT was with, uh, I, think, was, I think, with the Marlins before he, when he started out, before he came in with the Phillies. So he's been with the Phillies for a couple of years, and I'm really curious to see what he's, where he's going to be in 2021. Yeah, he was he was traded to Philly, I believe, for Sixto Sanchez was included in that trade. Wow, that's that's impressive. Okay, well, we know who's going to be there. Let's see, we've talked about uh, Trevor and we've talked about JT, and now let's take a look at everybody's favorite, Mister DJ Lemayhu. All right, DJ, this guy is amazing. I, I don't know. I mean, I've never liked it because having to face this guy because when he comes to bat, he his stats are outstanding. He's able to do so much more than whatever his competition is. And even just in a 60-game season of 2020, he had over 10 home runs. You know, his batting average was 364. His own base percentage was 421. This man, he commands the plate. He he had some difficulties, and there was a couple little bounces around. There was also some health issues, but... You th- you talk about that with 195 at bats in 2020 and what he was able to achieve, you know I found that out freaking standing. Yeah, you you said it. I mean, early on he couldn't really like he couldn't like get settled down at all, and he was really at a crossroads when he went to the Yankees, and he made it well worth it for them. I mean, his first year with them, he had 26 homers, 102 RBIs, hit 327. And then last year, with you said the ten homers, three sixty four, and he's yeah. been to three All Star games. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Uh, he's been to three All Star games, three Gold Gloves, two Silver Sluggers, two batting titles, and he's hitting three hundred five over his career. So he's really turned his career around in a short time. I think anybody would be happy to get him. So I, I think the Yankees will probably pony up a lot to keep him there, but. I, you know, maybe he's looking for something new. Maybe he wants to try something else. And because he's been able to play 
basically a utility player. You know, I, I don't think he's done shortstop, but you've seen him on second and third and first base. You know, I mean, a man like him, he's he knows how to get to play. He's a professional, and any team would be lucky to have him. Do you see anybody on the horizon that you think will be uh, going after DJ? Um, I mean, I'd expect him to stay with the Yankees just because the Yankees can pretty much afford every, anything they want, and they gave him a qualifying offer. But they did say he could possibly get interest from the Blue Jays, Nationals, Angels, or Dodgers, possibly. I would like to see the Blue Jays bring in some stronger talent. I mean, they're doing great. But that would be interesting to see somebody like DJ with uh, the Blue Jays. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people throwing the Blue Jays' name in there around. I, I even heard Trevor Bauer as well, possibly, going to Toronto or have an interest from them. Wow, that could really be exciting. I, I don't know how that's going to work out, but I, I'll, we'll keep an eye on that because I'm curious to see what the Blue Jays look like by this time next year. Let's take a look at a few other. Okay, then. Of course, you and I are talking about Charlie Morton. Charlie Morton, we've been very fortunate here to bring him here after the uh, after he left the Astros. He was actually considering retiring back then. But the thing of it is, too, is Charlie just lives right down the road in Bradenton, Florida, which is no more than an hour tops from probably St. Pete. And so he's got his family established in this area. He's He had a great first year, and his second year here was you know, also doing some really fantastic work and not just on the field, but as far as a leader for that team. I think a lot of the folks look at him as a mentor. Uh, he has a nice, quiet, calm personality. I think that, you know, we were very fortunate to Tampa to have somebody like him. I was a little surprised that Tampa didn't just come in and say, yes, Charlie, let's go ahead and do this next year. But I think also Charlie has a little hesitancy. I think he's still looking at retirement, but I think he'd like to get another World Series underneath his belt. And a lot of us were hoping that in Game 6 of the World Series would be won just so Charlie could go into Game 7 and get himself another World Series. Because I was excited about that as much as I was winning the World Series itself. See, the idea of seeing Charlie out there on the mound for the last game of the last season. I think he would have definitely retired if that was the case. Yeah, I mean, if that were me, I went out there Game 7 and we won it, then I'd say, hey, you know what? We want it. I'm going out on top. I'll see y'all later. But the the thing is with the Rays is most of their decisions come from the financial aspect of it. And I saw that, you know, they might have to sign up for under $10 million and it could easily be for him. You know, whoever, you know, pays me the most is where I wind up. And, you know, that could end up being the Mets, the Yankees, Red Sox. It could be anybody. But I think if somebody really came, oh, I'm sorry. I think <laughs> I think if somebody <laughs> came up with enough money, they might get his interest. But I got a feeling, like I said, I think he's real a real base kind of guy. He's got himself centraled. He's got himself, you know, he's at peace the way things are in his life. Appears to be, and having his home right here, I think he's at an age, he, you know, that he doesn't feel the need. I I, I hope and I feel that. Financially, he's probably as comfortable as he needs to be. It's about the passion of the game and what he wants to achieve with it. So, and I think he wants to be respected too. So, Tampa sometimes doesn't respect their players like initially with Blake Snell a couple of years ago when they gave him a bump of $15,000 a year. Ah, you know, but I mean, so he needs the respect, he needs the love. And I think he would stay here. And again, I think it was also a, a reason why he came to Tampa because of his Bradenton home and why he may come with us still yet. So we'll see. Yeah, and that's the thing. He said that he wants to stay in this area because he lives here. And, you know, why would you want to move? I mean, you live in the Bradenton area. It's, I mean, the weather's nice all year round except right now. But you don't have to move after spring training. You pretty much stay at home for spring training in the regular season as well. It's pretty much right in the middle of St. Pete and Port Charlotte. So that is a really big thing that the Rays have going in their favor. Well, with Charlie Morton in the future, do you see him like five, 10 years from now? Do you see him not necessarily as a manager, but maybe as a pitching coach or, or do you think he'll maybe just step away from the game completely in the future? I don't know. I, I could see him possibly being a coach because I mean, he kind of seems like he is a 
anyways with the Rays. You know, what he's done with Glass now and Snell, he kind of leads by example with the, you know, we've complained about it forever is, you know, going after guys, attacking them and not wasting time. So I could see him possibly becoming a coach, but he also seems like a guy that could just be like, okay, I'm, I'm done. And <laughs> you, you don't hear from him anymore. Yeah. He, he could go raise his own horses. I think he's got, I know cash talks about having a stable, but I think Charlie actually does have a, a love of horses, but anyway, so that's, that's kind of where we are right now here. At Baseball biz, Brandon and I taking a look at some of the free agents. And again, Trevor Barr, whose excitement and whose personality brings more than just his talent to the game. You're looking at JT Romito and uh, as a catcher who's just phenomenal. You know, he still has something at the bat, but what he's able to do for performance and getting people trying to steal base, poink. You know, that's what uh, that's just outstanding. So I'm looking forward to that. And of course, DJ LeMay, who, yeah, he'll probably be a Yankee, but it would be interesting to see if he landed somewhere else. And Charlie, well, we just pretty much said what, how we feel about him. He's a great guy. So looking at great guys, one of the things that we talked about last week were the upcoming awards, the BBWAA, and saying, okay, you know, who is the rookie of the year? Who gets the Cy Young? Who gets the manager of the year? And a couple of these, let's go ahead and string it out over several days. So for the last two days, today being Wednesday, Monday and Tuesday, there was two awards that were announced. Monday, the rookie of the year. And uh, yesterday, the Manager of the Year Award. So let's dig into that just a little bit. It's really interesting to see two very good young players come up as far as Rookie of the Year. And and you look at these two gentlemen. Another thing, too, is interesting is that the evolution of the game has come with a bit more diversity. Uh, We've talked in the past about how many people there are from other countries, but we haven't always talked about as far as looking at minorities from this country as well. And that means we're looking as far as like the number of African-Americans. And this year, the Rookie of the Year Awards brought in two fantastic young men, both African-American, and they achieved a lot. Now, for those of you who don't know, as far as the BBWAA Awards, how does it go again? I'll be real brief. It is 30 different sports writers, one from each market, each of the 30 markets, and they vote for their top one, their top second, and their top third person that they th- they think should get the award. So you would get, you know, not everybody, you're going to get a diversity about as far as who, how many get selected for first, etc. Kyle Lewis, for the Seattle Mariners, he got 30. 30 first place, unanimous. Everybody across the board picked that young man. So I think that's outstanding. It says a lot for him. So I'm looking forward to see how he continues with his career. He showed a lot of a lot of energy, you know, and and even with the announcement, he had Cal Ripken, I believe it was, announcing it. You know, it wasn't like the nice ceremony you get with everybody up on the stage. It was a Zoom call, but it was very, very encouraging to see him. Yeah, it's it's great to see like I mean he's only the fourth Mariner to win the rookie of the year, the first since Ichiro and oh yeah, I don't really know a whole lot about the other divisions this year, I feel like, you know, we really didn't get enough time to digest everything from this season, but right. from what I've done so far in the research and looking up, you know, highlights of him, he seems like a really great player with a bright future. I mean, he hits 262, 364 on base, 437 slugging, 11 homers, 28 RBIs. I mean, he started off really high, went into a little bit of a slump midway through the year, but he finished pretty good as well, so. It's going to be interesting to see where he goes from here. Exactly. Yeah. And, and like rookie of the year, I mean, to have been seeing that much support from all 30 writers, they're seeing exactly the same thing as you. So congratulations to Kyle Lewis from Seattle and becoming the American League Rookie of the Year. Also, looking at the National League, Mr. Lewis got 30 votes for first place. National League, Devin Williams from Milwaukee also achieved that. However, he only had 14 first place. That's not to take anything away from him. It just means that Kyle Lewis stood out so much above and beyond all the other talent that he had. And so, let's see, Devin Williams got got the award. And beneath him was Alec Baum from Philadelphia with nine. Jake Cronenworth with six. 
And then after that, it diminishes quite a bit. But Devin Williams got 14 first place. Six people selected him for second and seven for third. So that gave him, as far as their rating, ranking system, 95 points. And Alec Baum had 74 points. Looking back up at Kyle Lewis, he had 150 points. So <laughs> there is definitely, definitely a support for, for that young man and what he's achieved. We'll see how that goes future with with Devin Williams as well. For Williams, looking at him, he absolutely dominated this year. I mean, in 22 appearances, he did 27 innings, gave up only four runs. Only one of them was earned for a three ERA of .33, only eight hits, nine walks, and 53 strikeouts. So he was absolutely dominant this year as a rookie. <laughs> So do you think it's just that the competition was different, you know, as far as, uh, I mean, that I don't want to take anything away. The man got the award for a reason, but do you think necessarily that the, he had a stronger competition than, um, than Kyle Lewis did? Um, I'm not sure to be honest. Cause I mean, I don't really know a whole lot about this rookie class. The only other guy I really heard of was, uh, Cronenworth. That's because he played for the race for a while, but. The NL does seem like it has more deeper talent, mm-hmm. at least from what I've looked at so far. So that could be it. Or just Kyle Lewis just was that impressive. But I can't say for certain either way, because like I said, we hadn't really had time to completely observe and digest this season. But it, it could be a mixture of both. Yeah, and, and I'll be looking at him and the others as well. So I want to congratulate both those gentlemen. And definitely have done, you know, brought a lot to the game as well. We're looking for that kind of excitement out there. We're looking for uh, potential to see who's going to be leading these teams in this leagues in years to come. When these people go to be free agency, it'll be interesting to see what they'll be making. But until that time, we also need to take a look at the awards from last night on Tuesday, the manager of the year award. And you and I both have had a couple of, uh, you know, had a couple of horses in these races in both the AL and the National League. When it came when it came to the American League being from Tampa, was there any surprise at all that we said Kevin Cash, please? You know, he's been there a couple of times. This is the last two years, so this is the third year. And some were saying, you know, yeah, Kevin, it's the charm. Your third year, and you got it. And this man has done so much for a team that was led by John Madden and achieved so much prior to him. But expectations were, you know, very, very high for Kevin. And he came in with this whole idea, the analytics. It wasn't a new thing, but his intensity of using it has certainly done a lot as far as the selections of the players that Tampa has taken. And also his strategy as far as how long or how often he'll have a a, a batter in there. You know, we the whole thing with Snell. Now, remember that this... Oh, <laughs> that the um, the BBWAA actually did this voting prior to the postseason. I don't know that it would have done any differently because of Game Six, but the thing of it is, to me, that would that was just one instance where everything he had did not work. You look at everything else. Put that game aside. That man has been outstanding. He has just achieved so much using the analytics. Picking players that have been, you know, who, who just with Eric Neander, it's been amazing. You know, you look at working with the Pirates and getting Austin Meadows and Tyler Glass now. And Kevin Cash and Kyle Snyder and the other coaches have just done a fantastic job. So I am not surprised and I am grateful to hear that Kevin Cash was acknowledged and given the American League Manager of the Year award. Yeah, and it's well deserved as, because. I mean, to look at it, they went 40 and 20 and won the AL East. But you look deeper, you know, they, they don't have the payroll, of course. They bring that up every single time. So I feel obligated to say that. <laughs> oh, kill me now. Jesus and crackers. Also, with the, all the injuries they had this year as well. I mean, they were bringing guys up. And they say, this is who's playing this night. And they're like, who? We never heard of some of these guys. <laughs> and they come up and they're successful. So to do all of this, win the AL East with all those injuries that they went through, I mean, that's well-deserved. Oh, yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. So I'm very happy for Kevin and uh, as a Rays fan as well. But I feel like the man, you know, he's kind of a quiet type. He's a, he's a man who's a player. Talking about catchers, 
there's a, you know, that gives him a certain perspective, but I, I'm very happy for him and the race should be as well. So that's Kevin Cash, American League Manager of the Year. And uh, as long as we're doing voting breakdown like we did with the Rookie of the Year, let's see, of the, uh, again, there's a first, second, and third ranking each of the writers went ahead and selected. Kevin Cash got 22 of the 30 to select him in first place, which I think is great when you think there's 15 guys out there. The next one in was Rick Rentera with uh, Renteria, rather, with uh, five votes for first place. Charlie Montoya with two, Bob Melvin with one. And then to go from there, Kevin Cash total points through the ranking system had 126 second, Rick and Terry with 61. And we talked about Rick <laughs> to his, as far as the Chicago White Sox and them giving him a nod last week for his nomination, which is kind of interesting. We'll talk maybe a little more about the Chicago White Sox and their manager in a moment. Yeah, I kind of wanted Renteria to win a little bit just for the, the awkwardness of it all. Yeah, yeah. But if I didn't have a horse in that race, I probably would have too, but I definitely want to see Cash win. Then when you get into the National League Manager of the Year, not surprisingly, another Florida team, and there are only two, the Miami Marlins with Don Mattingly. All right, man, that was fantastic to see him there too. You figure a man who's had to fight all the adversity uh, that's gone on with Miami down there, especially this year, and you look at the team because they had, you know, you wonder, are they even going to be able to play this year because of COVID? And they basically, so many of these folks had, had come down with it. There was game and game and game after they were going to have to make up. So, but Don Mattingly and the Marlins certainly did it, but he's done a lot to build a good team there too. Yeah, and I remember when they first came down, they were the first team to, you know, have to shut down because of COVID. And a lot of people were like, oh, it's the Marlins. You can just get rid of them. Nobody will notice. But they they fought back, went 31-29, won a wild card game, or won the wild card series, actually. And yeah, they were a playoff team. And if you were to tell me early in the year that they were, with that roster, they were going to actually lose – about a week and a half, two weeks of games and still make the playoffs, I would have thought you were crazy. And this is another one that's really well deserved as well. I agreed. And like I said, I was I thought it'd be neat this year if we actually saw the Rays and the Marlins face off in the World Series. I mean it was a potential thing there. You know, when when I was uh, living up in Kentucky, the whole thing was you wanted to see U of L and UK face off in the NCAA in basketball. But uh, Don Manley did a fantastic job, especially this year with his team. Looking at the results, I'm going to take much akin to what we did at Kevin Cash and say first, second, and third of the 30 people who voted, 20 of them selected Don Mattingly. The second in the rankings was six of them selected Jace Tingler, the San Diego Padres manager. And I know you got a sweet spot for him as well, but he's, he was an, he was interesting to watch, but I'm certainly glad that Mattingly actually came up and got this this year. He just certainly deserved it. Uh, looking back at Cash, I wish I'd mentioned earlier, is who was awarding it to him was his old coach, Tony, or manager, Tony Francona. So that was kind of neat, too. Well, let's go ahead here. I want to thank everybody who's been participating with us and hope you enjoyed today's show. We took a look here at Baseball Biz at the Manager of the Year, the Rookie of the Year, and more importantly, maybe, I won't say more importantly, but also taking a look at the folks we had as far as the free agency. And I hope everybody's enjoyed this episode as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. Myself and Brandon, I look forward to talking with you guys real soon. You can reach Brandon at the Sports Blitz one on Twitter, and you can find me at the Baseball Biz on Twitter. So I hope you guys have another great week, and we look forward to talking with you again real soon. We would also like to thank X-Take RUX for providing the music rocking forward. <laughs>